Hello, and welcome to the Imposter Syndrome Network Podcast, where everyone belongs, especially if you think you don't. My name is Chris Grundeman, and I'm here with my very fabulous co-host, Zoe Rose. Hello. This is the Brian Friedman episode, and it's going to be great. Brian is both an IT security engineer and a business leader. Hey, Brian, would you mind introducing yourself a bit further to the Imposter Syndrome Network? Yeah, happy to. So Brian Friedman here. I work for a company called Complex. Uh, we really are focused on identity security, you know, looking at you know, where I came from and kind of as we kind of had these conversations. Uh, prior to that, I was working in the EDR space. And before that, I was building out stocks for the federal government. And before that, I was a you know, lowly stock analyst. And I think I started out my career as a Linux admin you know, back in the day. I was really kind of looking forward to enjoying this conversation with you guys. Perfect. Thanks. Today, I actually want to start with something a little different. We'll get into your career in InfoSec in a minute. Yeah. But first, I have to ask, because I heard you race motorcycles, and so I just want to know if you are a crazy person. Uh, not a crazy person, but my wife, looking at the checking account, often thinks I am. <laughs> but, you know, I, when I'm uh, not working, I really think it's important to disconnect, get away from a screen, and really kind of do something with your hands or really help you put in a different mindset than you would be at work. Uh, so being able to be free and live on the edge a little bit, a little bit of the adrenaline junkie in me, um, I love doing it. Plus, working with my hands, building engines, building bikes. Uh, it's a fun way for me to decompress and relax. That's awesome. Yeah. So I actually ride motorcycles as well. So not to be disparaging, I was, I was joking. I've never raced uh, motorcycles though, which does sound pretty intense and kind of awesome. And I, that resonates with me a lot, right? The, the mechanic side of it. Mm -hmm. I've, that was kind of the thing I had with my dad was we've always worked on cars together. And I definitely do it less now than I would like. But getting out in the garage and actually like you know, physically working on a machine is a really cool, I find, you know, just different mindset from the kind of day-to-day -day working on a network, working on security, working on storage, whatever you're doing in IT, it's all through a computer and a keyboard and actually kind of solving problems with wrenches and hammers is, uh, is a cool diversion. It kind of still works the same part of your brain a little bit, but, but gets more physical. So I don't know, I, that sounds like that's your experience as well. Yeah, you're, you're all just chasing a high, you know, I want my code to compile, my script to work, or I just want my engine to turn on, right? It's all the same how you're problem solving, uh, but it's just different ways and different way and things. And it's fun. So like I asked, what kind of bike do you have, though, Chris? Yeah, so I've got a like it was a basket case, but it's mostly a 70s Sportster, an Ironhead Sportster that me and my dad actually built from from parts. So, yeah, pretty cool. That's really cool. I don't even own a car. <laughs> <laughs> what type of bus do you ride? <laughs> I have a bicycle. Oh, I love bikes, too. Yeah. It is coral. Okay. It's a children's bicycle. <laughs> Does it have tassels and a pinwheel on it? <laughs> it doesn't. I'm actually quite disappointed. But I do, I do race it with the other six-year-olds because Dutch children are very, very good at uh, uh, cycling. But anyway. Oh, yeah. In the Netherlands, I bet, yeah, riding a bike is kind of like racing a motorcycle in other places, maybe. I am very jealous of your guys' bicycling infrastructure over there. I love biking places and uh, cycling is another passion of mine. But, you know, being able just to go anywhere on a bike is great. I'm saying I race the six-year-olds because I'm really rubbish at it, but I'll pretend I'm good at it. Um, it is one of the places that, like, I'm scared to get caught in the bike lane because I'm scared of getting run over. I'm not scared of the cars. I'm scared of the cyclists. <laughs> but, um, no, that's a really good point. I, I, I do the same is when it comes to decompressing because you, you focus so much so heavily in the mental space when it comes to technology. So it's nice to get away from the keyboard for sure. One question that I had was kind of a, you, you've told us basically what your company does or what you do at the company, but is there a kind of a description of what you would do in a typical day to understand kind of where the context is, where you sit? Oh, in a typical day, it's all over the place. I think there's a couple of kind of factors you need to take into account, kind of given where I sit in the org and what do I do and kind of what a typical day would look like for me. Complex is a growing company, very much still in startup mode as we were growing, new to market, maturing. So when you do that, you have a, a role that wears many, many hats, you know, from the managerial aspects of people management, managing remote teams and the difficulties that come with that, along with, you know, what you do from the technical side to solving customers' problems, uh, engaging with them, supporting sales and those types of items. So any given day, I'm working on building out partnership relationships. I'm working on team management items. I'm working on solving technical problems, doing sales items, helping you know customers achieve technical wins. 
And I think those are kind of the major categories uh, of kind of what I focus on. The other part I always like to make sure I, I do do is really focus on evangelism, you know, speaking on LinkedIn or attending conferences or really making sure I'm also actively learning in my space and my vertical, but also staying aware of kind of what's going on and trending across industry. So even if it's just perusing LinkedIn, because you know, people are going to self-talk about themselves all the time, at least you kind of keep track of what is going on in the space and in the industry and what other people are talking about, which is good information overall to have. I like that point of being allowed to be on social media as part of your job. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I've had a few bosses that uh, looked very badly down on me when I was on social media because it was like, oh, well, you're just on social media. But no, I, I think it's actually quite a key part of a technical career, understanding other people. Well, I mean, newspapers is like the same thing, right? It's here's my summary of stuff. It's, it's converted to a news feed, to Twitter, to LinkedIn. And, and I'll be honest, even the new forms like TikTok, you know, barring the cybersecurity concerns, which I certainly understand, it, it has made, uh, you know, advanced topics very, very consumable for a younger audience. And I actually, I'm very, very pro TikTok when it comes to that aspect of them. Yeah, I've seen some really good TikToks talking about security specifically, like mm -hmm. even hands-on, like technical, technical stuff. It's really cool. Yeah, we spoke to Grant Colgan, who is uh, a pretty big InfoSec TikToker uh, not too long ago, which is pretty cool. So I think we've got a, you know, a decent handle of kind of what you're doing at Complex. And, and I, I think one thing that's interesting to me is that point about this is a small company. And so we're all wearing multiple hats. Have you always worked at small companies or is this a new thing for you or, or do you have a preference kind of big versus small? No, I, I've worked for a couple of big companies. So I've worked for companies like Hewlett Packard Enterprise, you know, Fortune 10, I think at the time, right? So very, very big behemoth. I worked for um, General Dynamics. I've worked for, those are probably my th two biggest companies I've probably said i worked for, but I've also worked for some nonprofits. So uh, I used to work for the college board. So the company that manages the SATs in the United States and college admission processes there. Uh, I've also worked for a company called Silence when I joined them a little bit later. Uh, so I'd probably say they were on the latter stage of, you know, startup. They were a good size, around 800 employees back then. So it was nice there. So it was a little bit more comfortable. Uh, this is probably the smallest company I worked for. It's been fun. I, I actually like it a lot. I think I'm more, uh, I prefer the um, startup atmosphere. Uh, but I definitely think there's a lot of value in people, especially as you're kind of going into career, to have strong considerations for uh, larger enterprises. You'd certainly get a lot of support, a lot of knowledge, a lot of training, a lot of processes are kind of baked into the education there. The startups tend to be a lot of trial by fire, and they throw a bunch of things in sink or swim style, right? They just don't have time to put money or invest into people so much. And if that's your preferred learning preference, that's great, and you can certainly go for it. But I wouldn't discredit people spending time in you know big enterprise or big tech um, because there's a lot of ways you can learn in those spaces too, before you may choose to go try out in a, a startup or some kind. That's a really good point. I, I find for me, I learn faster in startups because it is that trial by fire. But mm -hmm. in bigger organizations, I find that it's, you have a bigger budget for training, but you have to deal with the soft skills more heavily, you know, because you have to deal with politics and you have to deal with people and that's the hardest skill. So I find that actually big organizations more challenging for me than the smaller ones. You know, the people skills and the soft skills alone are, are a huge breaker or make or break for a lot of people and kind of success and failure around kind of moving up in the organization, kind of the direction where people want to take their careers. You know, people with uh, weaker soft skills may choose, you know, their preference and desires to go more of a more technical mastery role, uh, which I wouldn't say is limiting, but, you know, it's uh, very hardcore to do that, right? But there's also a few really good soft skills, you know, looking at evaluating careers around sales or people management. Technical evangelism are all great things to do as well, but still remaining technical on the back end. Yeah. Now, speaking of learning and maybe the flip side of learning, which is teaching, I believe you're an adjunct professor at uh, George Mason University, which is where you also got your, your BS and your MS in cybersecurity. Is that all correct? And can you tell us a little bit about being an adjunct? I don't know what adjunct means, but professor sounds impressive. Why don't you tell us what that is? What's, what's going on there? Yeah. So uh, an adjunct is, I guess, uh, a part-time professor. What George Mason does is, is pretty cool, and I, I like this a lot, is that they uh, bring in people who have worked in industry uh, for a number of years and have them come back and, and teach. The nice part about this is, one, you're teaching the, the curriculum that they've designed and put together, but you're also to allowed and encouraged to overlay your professional experience on top of that. So um, right now, I teach a course around uh, cybersecurity program management. 
considerations you make for building out these bigger IT projects, managing teams, managing people, bringing together deliverables, whether it's physical or digital or software or app or you know, whatever it might be, you know, what should you care about? What do you need to manage? What do you need to know? And things I've kind of learned from my past experience I'm able to give to students, which I think is really, really valuable having that contact. Uh, I remember back kind of when I was an undergrad, I never really felt like I kind of got that. I kind of felt like what I would see during interviews was like way ahead of what I would learn, you know, this past semester at college, which I didn't like that gap. I always kind of felt like I was trying to catch up to kind of be current of my peers of, you know, who were already in this space. So I, I like that kind of they've adopted that sort of program part of that. Yeah, that's a really good point. It's that it's the hands-on experience and being able to show real world examples and have real world examples in the training. I think that would make a difference for the students. On that same kind of strand, Chris mentioned that you have a bachelor's and a master's, and then I also see you have a CISP as well, I believe. So we ask people quite a bit about their kind of mindset when it comes to certifications and more traditional training. So I'd be interested in how you feel like that's benefited you or maybe didn't, or what's your perspective on both the traditional training as in the master's and bachelor's, as well as certifications? So... I think I'm probably going to ruffle a few feathers with this opinion here. I always felt kind of like a lot of those things were just really simply receiving the receipt. I, I know I'm fairly well accredited with a, a bachelor's, a master's, and a CISP, but I don't feel like that has improved me as a practitioner all that much to have that knowledge and to have kind of gone through those courses. I feel like there's a special nuance to being able to apply knowledge, which really, as an interview, when I'm hiring people, I'm, I'm seeking to see that capability. I think when you look at kind of those education levels, you're really looking at a baseline of knowledge or a common talking vernacular, which I feel like you don't need to attend a traditional four-year university or a master's program or a state, right? It's just to have common language at the core of it. So I, I never like to say that I require those types of things, or I think people should have them. Now, on the flip side, there certainly are valuable, and there's a lot of careers, a lot of companies, a lot of organizations that are going to have minimum requirements of education to take on those types of jobs, you know, especially if you're looking at anything government or federally related, like they, I need a minimum four-year degree or certain certifications to be able to work at it. Now, there has kind of been trends and courses out there uh, that have been really great around application and knowledge. So you look kind of like a lot of stuff from uh, GSAC and Over the Wire are some really great stuff around applying knowledge and learning how things are, how things work together, which I like doing on my own. I like seeing some of those things, but personally have kind of that love-hate relationship when it comes to credentials and certifications, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, they can be, as you stated, right? I think they can be, or they at least they are used often as proxies. It's almost like, like a lot of human things, right? It's, it's a laziness hack where I don't, you know, have the time to get to know every single candidate. So I'm just going to say, if you, you know, struggled through eight years of college, you probably have some staying power and an ability to learn. If you, you know, took the time to go learn enough, you know, concepts to pass a, a CISSP, you probably have a decent handle on cybersecurity. And so it's almost like a proxy. It's saying, okay, instead of digging in and, and having, you know, eight hour conversations with every single person, I, I'm just going to kind of check some boxes and then move on. But that ends up kind of having this adverse effect, which is this gatekeeping effect potentially. So I think it's, in, you know, it's, it's refreshing to hear that when you're hiring, you're not strict on those things. When you're hiring, you're not strict on those things. What do you look for when you're hiring? I mean, how, how do you, how do you weed things out if you're not using those kind of receipts, as you call them, which I think is a really good way to look at them? Uh, what are you looking for? So a lot of soft skills during uh, kind of the interview process, I look at follow-up, you know, are they engaging me with saying thank you, LinkedIn looking, I'm actually actively looking to see if they are looking at my profiles prior to the interview. I ask some questions about my own company, you know, what have you learned, what do you have questions on? I'm looking for a desire to learn more. If a candidate comes on, I say, well, what questions do you have for me? He goes, oh no, you're fine. I think you explain things really well. I'm like, okay, he doesn't really care, hasn't really looked into me or looked into kind of what we do. Because I know we do some complicated stuff and naturally have questions of how does this work? How does this function? What kind of integrations are available? A whole slew of things, right? A number of different ways people's minds can go. But I look for that desire to investigate, that desire to look, desire to learn more. I also like doing, and I try to do more of it, active um, presentations too. They present a topic on me. How do you think? How do you investigate? And I'm going to question them. I want to see how they respond. I look for kind of that problem solving on their feet uh, type of reaction as I kind of evaluate people. It's not so hard coded. You know, some people like to be very kind of by feel based on kind of how I assess it personally. But I think that's kind of a really good way to kind of see how people react on their toes and respond to questions 
you know, somebody threw things out of left field and see how they are. And I certainly don't claim to be an expert in every technology. So I may just want to learn more. But they're really good at explaining it to me. I think they'll be good at explaining my tech as well. Awesome. That resonates with me a lot. I once had, I was hiring an intern and I actually had uh, twin brothers both apply for the internship mm-hmm. position, which I only had one spot. And not only were they twin brothers, uh, but these guys were, I'll say a little odd. Maybe this is, maybe, maybe, maybe some twins will write in and tell me this isn't odd at all. But they literally had taken all the same classes and had had all the same internships up to that point. And so like identical resumes, identical, you know, faces and bodies. Uh, I mean, like, like really like, okay, how do you, how do you choose one? And I'm, I'm actually really glad that happened to me early in my you know, managerial career because, you know, I, I had to figure out how to make this choice and what it came down to for me in that instance. And then I've used this kind of since then was, was just passion, right? Which one did I feel like really actually wanted to do this work, mm-hmm. you know, more than the other one. And, and that there was actually a pretty, that was one big, it was a pretty big distinction, right? One of them was kind of there. He seemed like he was phoning it in a little bit. The other guy seemed really passionate about what we were doing, what we were trying to do. And so it made that choice doable. And since then, it's made a lot of hiring choices a lot easier for me. I don't know if that resonates with you at all. It, it does. You know, there's a lot of like practical knowledge you really want people to search and dig for. You know, I, when I kind of think about education, certification, search and interviewing, like there's a, a great scene from that old Rodney Dangerfield movie, Back to School, where he's in the classroom and being kind of questions like, you need to build a factory. How do you go about it? And the professor has the book answer of, you apply for permits, you get zoning approved, blah, blah, blah. And Rodney goes, no, this is not right at all. You actually need to increase the politicians. I need to you know, get the garbage guy on my side. I need to get these guys to ignore me. I got to scrub this guy. I got to get this guy paid off, right? And that's all real type stuff. You know, When I was pursuing my master's degree, I ran into a lot of cases of where it was just simply career students who would give book answers. But I'm like, no one follows policy entirely. People are going to fight me on password changes. I know there's definitely going to be a C-level that's going to tell me, I don't want to change my password. I have to force that type of thing, right? And I think kind of being aware of these things and being able to solve those problems, you know, kind of as you said too, right? Having that passion is, is really kind of any important to have any part of any hiring process or, you know, considering team members or even on the flip side too, if you're in an interview or looking at jobs, seeing how your manager or potential manager would be interacting with you. What kind of questions are they asking about you? How are they evaluating you? Are they seen distant? You know, I've had some bad interview experiences where I had a manager or a person I would be partnered with uh, they were literally reading, reading me questions from a, a website of like, how does your family view you? How does, you know, this like generic stuff that was like hallmarky. And I was like, I don't want to be tied to this person, right? If they can't be thoughtful enough or passionate enough to interview me in a real way, you know, why would I want to kind of tie you know, my career to this type of person? So um, a lot of things to kind of consider from, you know, both sides as a manager or as a, you know, a younger person or a candidate kind of coming up and evaluating companies. Yeah, I definitely relate to a couple of the things. I do disagree in some things only because I'm me and I like to disagree. But uh, but like the the point about the passion, I do when I interview people and I look for a potential hire, I do the same sense where I value personally I value people skills higher than technical. There is a point you need a certain amount of technical and depending on the role, there are certain requirements they must meet. But I, I also look at the, well, how does this person interact, interact with me? The type of questions they ask, I'm looking at how they think, like how their logic flows go. But one thing that I specifically do is I, I don't say, well, they have to ask me questions because I know the type of person I am is if I don't think there's a valuable question, I'm not going to ask one. I just am not. And so I'm trying to think of in my team, what skills do I already have? What type of workers do I already have? And who am I looking for to fill it? So for example, I might have a very technical person. The next person in, I probably wouldn't want somebody that's super, super technical, super focused on the technical. I might want somebody more focused on the people. So it's, it's not just when I'm hiring, it's not just they have to follow this kind of logic flow or they have to ask these questions or ask a question even. It's more what type of person are they and how are they going to balance my team out whilst also obviously looking at do they have the skills or can I train them to have the skills? But I really like the point about wanting to learn because I think in a technical career, it is something you need. You have to want to go further because it changes so much, you know? So I definitely relate to you both on that one. I suppose you could call it passion. Yeah. I typically like to call it passion, but I know that some people read that in as I expect them to be over committed to work. And I don't expect that. I d- At the end of the day, I expect the person to go home. I don't expect them to stay 
hours just because. So that's why I tend to starting to reassess if the word passion is the right word. One, because the way I take it. Yeah, curiosity. I love that. Yes, definitely a curious person. A hundred percent. You need a natural curiosity. Yeah. Yeah. And you have to want to do the job, I think. Like, I, like I've seen a lot of people in roles where they didn't, they, like, they were totally qualified, but they didn't really want to do the work we were asking them to do. And no matter how great they are, they can be geniuses. And the product is terrible if they don't really feel like they want to do it, right? So that's what I mean by passion. I don't know. Like, do you like, do you want to do this? Yeah, that's a good point. It's buy into the company, you know, goals and directives and what their kind of thesis is for where they want to take the organization. If you don't agree with that, you think it's rad, you know, don't phone it in for something that you care about, right? It's, it's unenjoyable for you as an employee. It's also not a great outcome for uh, your employer, right? But find something you're passionate about because it makes going to work and working a lot more fun. That's a really good point. Yeah. And it's long-term as well. I don't want to hire somebody for six months. I want somebody that's going to enjoy the job and stay because ultimately that's the goal. So those are really good points there. And I think what all of, all of us have kind of touched on is it's not looking for a specific type of person. You know, it's not this exact person or these exact skills. It's, I want them to want the role. I want them to learn and grow in the role. And I think that encourages diversity in teams much more effectively, or at least from my personal experience, which is me trying to create a segue <laughs> into um, one thing you mentioned earlier, Brian, before we were recording was your history of managers. And how historically you've had female managers, which is quite unique, I would say. Yeah, uh, all the way up into uh, this career, I've, I've almost exclusively had female managers uh, my entire professional career, which, you know, in, in tech and especially in cybersecurity has been, uh, it, it doesn't happen. So I feel like a little bit of a, a, not a snowflake, a little out there, an outlier with that type of fact here for me. Uh, but I, I got to say, it's, it's been a wonderful, wonderful experience, some great people. And I think it's kind of really helped me grow into kind of the person I am today, having those people supporting me. What is it about a, I mean, it sounds like as a group, I mean, obviously you know, each of these people was individual, so I don't want to overgeneralize too much, but it sounds like you've really enjoyed having female managers. You've had had some male managers as well. Obviously you are a male manager. What do you see as like the differences or, you know, why, why do you make that statement? Like what, what was, what was great about working for a woman versus, you know, what you've had experience working for a man maybe? Or maybe not even the comparison, but just what did you like about the, the experiences you've had? I, I think you kind of, to answer that question, I think it really kind of helps to kind of dive a little bit into my own growing up and maturing psychologically, I guess. You know, thinking back to kind of myself in high school, college, very much a, um, I don't say know-it-all, smart-ass, probably a bit more appropriate here, right? I'm determined to be kind of like the Dr. House uh, person where I know it all because I'm right, you have to listen to me, very authoritarian style, right? But uh, working with uh, women managers, you see how they interact, how they push back, and also how they listen, how they kind of listen to what your concerns are, what people or whoever they might, whoever they might be interacting with might be concerned about, and how they are solving those problems. Uh, and you find very, very quickly that, you know, by being able to active listen, be able to kind of take in and hearing things and echoing concerns back, be able to get, progress a lot further, not just in your career, but also interpersonally among other teams, other people you might have to work with. No one can really kind of be a silo in the workforce and just input output all day without having to deal with anybody. You have to deal with people. Uh, and having that strong focus on not only people relationships, but also how do I engage with them interpersonally in a soft skills level was really valuable for helping me grow and mature as a, as a person as well. And it's something I really kind of enjoyed over the, the years. Very cool. And I, I'm guessing you've taken some of that into your own management style at this point, or, or has it rubbed off? Uh, yeah. You know, asking people around, how can I help them? How are you best enabled? How do you prefer to be interacted with? You know, it's um, exposing some sort of sensitivities to kind of what their concerns and their preferred management methods. I certainly have the ways that I like to lead teams very laissez-faire, but I jump in when I need to, some basic standards for reporting. But like, how do you like to learn? How do you like to be educated? Do you want weekly calls? Do you want me to be in front of your face? Do you want me to check in constantly? Or you prefer me just to, you know, be hands off, leave you alone, uh, and then swoop in when you feel like you might need me, depending upon where they are in the role or how they like to engage. I like to kind of ask them these questions and how I can best support them. And that's been really kind of a great way to approach this in my own management style. Yeah, I love that. I, it took me a very, very long time before I was asked that question in my career. And I never, I always thought there was something wrong with me because I had struggled. I, I struggled managing upwards. It was very difficult. And I always felt like I clearly was doing something wrong because I didn't get the assurances that I was doing it right in the way that I needed to. 
And it took me until somebody asked me, you know, what are your values and behaviors? How can you measure your success and how can I help you see where you're succeeding or help you uh, improve in other areas? And uh, I think that's very important. A key part of a manager is being able to apply that, but also taking the time to recognize that people are different. And so the way that they need to be managed is going to be different as well. So I really like those points that you made. I think you bring up a good point too also is that you as an employee, it's also really good to just ask. Sometimes people might be oblivious to what your needs might be specifically. I would like to have, you know, biweekly check-ins to kind of know, am I performing the right way? And if I need to change, I would like to know that. You know, and the check-ins may be, hey, you're doing great. I love what you're doing. Keep going down this route. Or maybe minor adjustments like, hey, should you focus more on documentation? Let's review some calls that you just did. I would like you to change some of your language on your improvement. Or maybe you say you're bringing something to your manager of, hey, I didn't feel like this was right. I didn't feel like it hit right. Can you review this with me? I would like some feedback. Don't be afraid to kind of ask, but also don't have that expectation on yourself that your manager will just tell you everything you need to do. Your managers are busy. They're dealing with a million different things. Sometimes you are just unfortunately not top of mind. And by being able to be comfortable enough in your own skin to ask is, is a tough lesson to learn, but also a valuable skill to have to be your own champion as well within the organization. Uh, I always look very, very fairly on people who can kind of tell me, what they need, or if they tell me also the rest, like, hey, I don't respond well to that, Brian. I would prefer we kind of went this way. I greatly appreciate that type of feedback because it helps me work with my team better. Yeah, totally, totally. I had one question that is completely different. Uh, so no segue, but it's one that in security, you do see a lot of, and a lot of people that haven't done it before don't really know where to start. I don't have any experience working in America, in the U.S., so I don't have experience with this, but I saw that you have dealt with clearance, uh, or at least that's how I'm reading it. I do know there are certain roles that require clearance. So could you give from an external perspective, kind of for somebody that has no experience with that, what's the process there? Is that something that's quite difficult to get? And is it, is it something realistically a lot of people should be considering? I don't know. So the first thing is, uh, even in the UK and England, you can't just go ahead and say request, I would like clearance. There's a concept that they're called a need to know, meaning you have to be a part of a job or part of a position that's going to have access to information to be granted that clearance in the first place. The second part is there's a lot of varying degrees and specialty sectors of clearance levels from public trust to secret to top secret to even beyond uh, special compartmentalized information around so, so energy is one that's very popular or not very popular, but a, a common subset of their own clearance system evaluations, really looking to see if I share this information with you, uh, are you a risk of linking it? Are you a risk of exposing it? Are you a risk to the government, whether it's you know United States or another one of engaging in that? And sometimes there are reciprocities of clearances where there are employees of um, the U.S. government who may work and support the Australian government as well. Uh, they would recognize that type of thing with friendlies. I wouldn't say something that's mandatory. Even though I spent almost a decade in the federal space uh, supporting companies, I had a variety of clearances. I like to joke for uh, my lanyard that I used to wear. You know, I looked like a, a rapper with amount of you know tokens and cat cards and IDs, and I can get into any building in Washington D.C. with it. While it was kind of fun and a great learning experience to do that, it's very much burdened down with people's and process and a lot of the slowdowns you kind of expect with, with working with federal or government type of projects. I think it's geographically based too. You know, if you work in a center where it's heavily government based, so Washington D.C., of course, you know, everywhere we have a, we call them Beltway Bandits, where they are all supporting government contracts, where a good portion of the jobs are government based, where you would need a clearance. So if you're looking to kind of go down that route, it's, you can apply for jobs that will require it. And often the job description will tell you they will sponsor you for a clearance. Often it's easier to kind of start off at a lower level looking for like a public trust or a secret because those are very easy to get uh, and great for starting out and for the process is really simple. Things that are like top secret and higher, you, you need to be kind of in the system and transitioning into those projects to kind of really kind of be considered or already have a top secret form another project or something like that. I didn't like the work. Uh, some people love the work. Some people love federal jobs. Uh, really kind of up to you. So just be honest with yourself about what kind of type of work and people you want to do or engage with. Um, I have found myself kind of considering going back to federal work sometimes purely just because it's a different style, different position. As I grow a family, I may want to have that style down the line. But um, I really do love the startup life, so I don't think I'll see myself doing that. Awesome. Well, that is about all the time we have for today. Brian, thank you for sharing your story with the Imposter Syndrome Network today. And thank you to all of the imposters tuning in. 
We really appreciate you spending your time and attention with us every week. If you enjoyed the show, please consider sharing it with a friend, a family member, or a colleague who you think it might inform or inspire. And feel free to link up with us on your favorite social media platform. If you can't find us, uh, just let us know. Before we shut down the recording though, Brian, I am curious, what would you consider the most valuable lesson you've learned in your career so far? Ooh, that's a really good question. One piece of advice I like to give people is never be the person to tell yourself no. So what I mean by that is don't say, I can't apply for that job because I don't have all the recs. Don't be the person to say, I can't ask for this. Don't be the person to say, I can't do something. If you want to go do something, go for it. And you might be rejected at the end of the day, but the valuable point here is that you're able to go do it. And more often than not, you may actually be as good a surprise, yes. And so you may actually be accepted for that role, except for that promotion, except for that job, except for that pivot wherever it might be that you might be caring about, but never be the person to tell yourself no. That's probably the single piece of advice I would tell people. Yeah, I like that a lot. And I think that is kind of in line with, with some other you know, advice we've gotten from other folks. I know, and it kind of ties back into what you said earlier about you know, kind of speaking up, telling your manager what you want, what you need. I think they're related anyway, if not exactly the same thing. A little bit. Uh, some, one is being your own self-advocate, which is a little bit different versus one you know, that little voice in your head saying, I can do this, I can't do this. You know, I, I want people to feel driven to kind of pursue what they want. And sure, they may get their hands slapped or told to go back, you know, but at least you're going back with feedback. What do I need to improve on? What am I missing? What do I need to study or focus on or practice? Whatever it may be, right? You get that feedback. So you're growing in a positive direction. And you're always taking steps forward. Very cool. Thanks. Do you have any projects uh, you're working on that you'd like the Imposter Network to know about? Or if not, or even if so, you know, where can people reach out if, uh, if uh, they want to maybe start a conversation or chat with you further? Yeah. So projects, fun stuff right here. I just finished reading a great book. Oh, shoot. Who was it? Chris Boss, a hostage negotiator for the FBI and how you interact with people. I actually thought, you know, the same techniques and practices around how you handle with hostages is great for communication styles as well, especially as you enter difficult conversations, uh, which happens in tech, you know, around uh, the server broke. I don't know why, right? You echo feelings, you respond in the right way. It's also been really great with uh, helping me communicate my wife a little bit better because sometimes I feel like a hostage. Uh, in terms of projects, you know, uh, professionally, we've really been working on uh, a lot of this core identity stuff. Uh, Gardner has been really great to us recently around announcing a new category around ITDR, identity threat detection response and complex. Myself and really building products into that space for a number of years. So we're really looking to expand the market, expand this new identity centric security mindset for a lot of folks and really kind of take this product out there. So having a lot of fun building that and bringing it to market. Awesome. That is great. And we will be back next week. Awesome. Well, thank you for having me, Chris. I've been told by many, many people that they could never have a female boss because they're the worst. So. Oh, they're the best. They listen to my feelings. They actually care. They give me shit, which is fine. You know, I appreciate that. They're actually really good at the job of figuring things out, investigations. You know, I wish there were more. I'm a little biased, but I agree. <laughs> <laughs>